Welcome to the brief on session three of BlockChat. In this session, we have with us Simon. Simon is a lawyer since more than 30 years in Australia. He's worked with regulators and legislators all over the world to add legislation that would uh, make our lives better. Simon has been on boards, part of businesses, is a successful uh, lawyer who has a special view on the tokenization of real estate. And this is mainly why we have Simon with us today. As usual, it's Denis Petrovicic, Makrim Hani, and today it's Simon with us. Simon, how are you? I'm very well, and thank you very much for having me. It's great to have you today. If you can give us a brief, uh, in your own way, about yourself and why are you interested in tokenization of real estate? Why is that subject dear to your heart? And why do you put an effort, because it is an effort that you put um, uh, outside your normal working uh, life and schedule to um, get acquainted and to um, impact in that part of the business? Um, look, I've, I've built some technology and innovation for 25 years and, and commercializing it, um, whether as a lawyer or a director or a capital raiser or a promoter or a, a, a beggar, um, whatever it might be. Um, and I got involved with blockchain, um, I, I, certainly not 2012 or anything else. Um, otherwise, we'd be having this pod chain, uh, podcast from the back of a very large yacht. But um, it, 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 uh, I, I, I came to it via a project with some colleagues um, and w we set up an investment fund. Uh, we thought that that was, at the time, one of the best ways to approach a fund of funds because we didn't know which user case would work, right? I mean, in 2017, who knew which user case was actually going to make success? In that process, um, I was involved uh, uh, no longer but in, in, in the early stages of a really interesting project which um, fractionalised um, truly in a, in a decentralised and democratised sense gold. And I know there's a few of those around the world, but I don't think they actually model this. So um, I, I, I have a current couple of uh, clients that, that are involved in different aspects of blockchain. But as part of that process, um, Julia, who is part of the, um, Dennis's team, uh, and I came across each other in a particular, uh, a particular forum. Um, and uh, I suppose, you know, blockchain has ridden the highs and the lows and, and those with legal expertise um, uh, tend to be easy to find in the highs and they're not so easy in the lows and I've kind of stuck with it. And um, I, I think that uh, when the idea of the tokenization of real estate um, was first explained to me, um, it made perfect sense. Um, not only did it make perfect sense, but Dennis and his team um, had, if not completely built, had built you know, a very substantial portion of, of, of what was an existing model and, and part of the problem, and it was the problem with the gold project, although it's going like a charm now, um, is the challenge of, of bringing these things to a practical um, conclusion. And um, so I, I, I've been lucky enough to continue to be involved and, and, and maybe, I mean, Dennis has got a, a obviously, a, extremely erudite and well-credentialed legal team um, back with him. But uh, over and above that and, and outside of that, I guess I, um, I, I, I qualify as the only other person that's held my hand up has, has been um, <laughs> not so far to donate my time to it. Um, and uh, one of these days it will pay off. Dennis, um, you had a very... Um interesting conversation with Mr. Owen prior to us going on air. You were talking about the corporate resolutions and the protection for 
people who buy tokens of tokenized real estate. Tell us the risks that you see today and what are the um, solutions for some of those risks? And how are you tackling uh, the idea of protecting every token holder uh, whenever he holds that token, similar to him holding a regular title today of a property or being invested through a REIT or any other mechanism, conventional or none? Um, yeah, well, is the question directed to me, I guess. <laughs> Actually, it's a question directed yeah. to you so that I can start the same conversation yeah, because, sure. guys, there was a conversation that was yeah. there running and I wanted yes. to capture the same conversation because it was so valuable okay. and it adds so much. Right. I, I loved it. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we were discussing um, about, uh, because one thing before uh, I answer is, uh, we connected through Julia uh, Buchholz, um, who's in, uh, in Perth, and she uh, is uh, in uh, close touch with Simon. Uh, and we started this conversation, I would say, like a year ago, maybe maybe even more, um, to basically analyze the applicability of of uh, of the model that we've kind of created with the corporate resolution in in conjunction with a with a smart contract and tokens to transfer economic rights to token holders. And um, and Simon took an interest because, there was a challenge in Australia uh, that most companies were dealing with is that um, however they were structuring the tokenization of a real estate asset or any real world asset for that matter was that they were triggering um, uh, a certain uh, limitation um, within that, that limited the ability to hold tokens to only 20 um, parties, I think, 20 holders, um, and if, if it goes beyond that number, uh, it immediately becomes regulated because it's actually uh, a trust, right? Um, and that's, I think, the conversation that we had at the time, and that's what, what triggered your interest through the corporate resolution, trying to understand, you know, the implications, how that would be um, regulated if it would be regulated in the Australian market. So that was the conversation we had. Um, and, and I know that you did your own kind of research on it and tried to figure out how, uh, you know, if, if we can indeed use that in Australia. Yeah, and, and that, that's exactly right. Um, you know, could it, could, it, uh, could it come to this part of the world? Um, and can I say that? The, the vast majority um, in Australia of people um, who thought about tokenization, who um, uh, but, but thought about uh, using blockchain to raise money, and, and, and you know, we Australians are a very inventive lot in trying to raise money, um, but uh, it, was, it, it was generally developers to raise money to build something. And, and that actually, it, it's not even just 20 people. It triggers, um, it, it, it triggers a raft of legislation, which is, um, let's just say, prohibitively expensive to bother to go down that path. Um, and and uh, uh, with a little bit of lateral thought, um, we at least came to the conclusion that, that if the project already existed, um, then the tokens could be used. Yeah, because there's considerable more risk whenever you're talking about a project under construction or hasn't been built yet, yeah? Sure. In my yeah. jurisdiction, it's not permitted to tokenize a project that is uh, under construction. It's only no. permitted no. to tokenize a built project. I, I think that I think that resonates in, in many parts of the world, yeah? So, but, but if, if you've built something and you already own it, then all, all you're doing is you're not even selling bits of the property. You're, you're selling bits of rights to the property, right? And, and, and um, uh, no legislation has, uh, well, I say caught up with that. Um, I, don't, I don't think they will. Um, so, you know, we came up with a solution that at least for some people, 
this could work in Australia. Um, and then that, that then expanded and Ocean Point kind of took over because it was in a development stage when we were going through all of that. And, and now Ocean Point is, um, I, I'm gathering from Julia and, and her conversations, Ocean Point is kind of the mothership um, and, and uh, you know, that might, that we might still use the smaller model in Australia, but um, I think a number of the customers, potential customers she's talking to um, are, are Ocean Point customers. Um, so uh, it's, it's very interesting, by the way. So Julia's doing great work on Australia. It's always interested, interesting, however, to listen to the other side of the uh, view, a lawyer's view to what we do. So usually you hear it from somebody who's trying to sell it or somebody who is technically involved in it. But a lawyer's view to what we are doing, because a lawyer would think about rights of uh, the client, rights of the prospective uh, investor uh, in a different way, isn't it, uh, Simon? So when you're, when you're looking at it in a, in a, in a uh, legal uh, framework and when you're seeing it with your eyes as a lawyer who was involved and has been actively involved with legislators, how do you, um, how do you look at the rights of individuals uh, mm. And are they less prominent whenever you talk about tokenized property? Um, is it a high risk asset class created immediately because we tokenized or not? No, and I'll, I'll, I'll begin that answer with a, a fairly flippant one, which is sometimes it depends upon the lawyer. Um, you know, <laughs> if you ask a lawyer if there is a problem, they'll tell you yes and 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 and, and he has uh, the interest to tell you yes yeah <laughs> yes. exactly the, the, the real thing is you know you've got a you've got a client with a project that that uh, you know that ostensibly is a very good idea um some lawyers um and, and that's been my history because of what i do um is to try and work out um uh, not not tricky, not risky, but 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 appropriate ways um, of being able to you know, bring those things to fruition, uh, which is I, I think we've done in Australia. We haven't, uh, uh, to my knowledge, we haven't actually. Um, I had an inquiry last week, but nothing much has come of that yet. But um, uh, you know, it's uh, look part of the conversation before we came on air um and and we probably should pick that up is that uh at the end of the day um there is no way of guaranteeing um against fraud and it doesn't matter you know whether it's whether we can do it for individuals in certain jurisdictions like as property or whether it's corporations um there is there is always going to be someone who um, will manipulate the system. And there are checks and balances and there's some thoughts that I've actually had over the last couple of days, which I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'm happy to kind of share broadly, but sure. I haven't shared with Dennis yet. And, 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 but, you know, the classic, and, and Julia is having this conversation, but the, the, the classic case in, in, in Western Australia in particular, um, we invented a system of land whereby um, there's a certificate of title and no transaction can occur um, on that bit of land, commercial or residential, unless the document, the mortgage, the lien, the whatever it might be, is registered with an authority. It's written on the certificate, which is now digitised, um, and so when you come to buy and sell that property, it's very obvious what goes on. London has a, uh, England has a, a different and a much a more archaic system whereby it costs you a lot more money and you have to hire um, a bunch of solicitors or notaries or whatever they are and, and they do due diligence going back over 30 or 40 years through documents and records to find out what was going on. Um, I think that there is the possibility um, 
in in each major jurisdiction where we go for some light, and I say light because it doesn't need to be hugely bureaucratic or anything else, but but a register, a simple register where, um, you know, anyone knows, well, I've got to go and just make sure that there's no tokens on this property, right? And if there are, then... I'm, until I'm until gonna... regulators probably oh. absorb that, yeah? And, and until regulators, until the land registrar comes and says, you are able to register. And, yeah. <clears throat> and I believe we are able to register a corporate resolution against a property, yeah? Uh, is, is that the case in Australia or not? Uh, no. In many countries in the world, if you have any dealing on a yes. property, now, legally, by law, if you have any dealing on a property, you need to register that dealing with the land registrar, yeah? In Australia, we call it a caveat, um, and, and it had a number of different names around the world. And if, if you were going to buy tokens on a property, um, you know, that would be a wise thing to do. I'm sure there are jurisdictions where it might not be quite the same, but, you know, it, it, it really wouldn't be a, a difficult add-on to minimise, you know, the very small potential of fraud, you know, down to a, 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 a tiny potential. And and I think, um, so the short answer to your question, Nagram, um, is um, no, I don't think there's any more risk at all. Um, you know, it, it, quite the contrary. Um, it's, it's uh, it can be handled uh, very simply. Um, and and uh, and obviously very efficiently, and that's the whole process very cost efficiently because hitherto now those systems are very expensive. You know, if you want to go and register a mortgage or something against the title, you know, it's it's I, it's a few four thousand dollars. I mean, you might only be trying to title tokenize five thousand dollars because you want to pay for your daughter's wedding. I don't know. Um, it's, it's what's what's the percentage uh, they charge in Australia to to register a mortgage? Uh, it depends upon the lawyer. There's okay. some set fees, and then there's fees by fees by by. So, is there stamp duty or government fees or notary fees? Uh, there, there are there are certainly registration fees. Um, but the lawyer is going to charge you for the mortgage document um, and and the land title search and everything else. So um, you, you're not going to get a mortgage under, and then the bank's going to charge you for evaluation. Sure. Um, and and you know, all, uh, you know that goes on and on. So it's not a it's not a cheap exercise, right? Um, yeah. And it, and it's and it's it's very involved. And I imagine you know. I can't imagine that it's hugely different in other places. You know, um, you might be able to tell me. I don't, Dubai, I don't know. I mean, you know, Dubai will not need a lawyer. Things are more um, simplified, if I would say. Uh, well, you register. Lending works on a different basis. So exactly. I, I, I know a little about it. I've done a couple of transactions, yeah. but I don't know enough about it to. You know, understand but still, the, it costs uh, it costs those few thousands, which 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 are not bad to save at all. I've just registered a mortgage, and it costed me around uh, what is equi equivalent to um, four thousand five hundred dollars uh, just yeah. in that piece of the process. Yeah, without the valuation, without without all the other uh, uh, relevant stuff. Now, Dennis seems to have a question here. The the last question I want to ask here before I leave it to Dennis, if we take it simply and we take it a step backwards and we say if we have forget about the tokenization part prior to the tokenization we're doing a conventional thing which is a, co a corporate resolution in australia today which is a relatively mature market and uh, with good investor protections can we register that corporate resolution with the land registrar to make it that that uh, solid uh, as as a, as an agreement uh no okay so you will not be able to register that um, corporate resolution with the uh, you, registrar. You 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 can you could register a KDF okay. against the piece of land. Um, can you explain but, to us but, what is a KDF, please? Uh, sorry, because I'm so, sure many people are asking the same question. Uh, first of all, you'd need a loan agreement. Mm -hmm. So there's there's your 
you know, two thousand to five thousand dollars, depending upon the nature of the, the law firm you had to draw up a loan agreement. Okay. Um, and and then um, you would you can register a caveat. You could you could register something that's on that certificate of title. Um, but if it ever got challenged, you've got 14 days to get down in court and enforce your loan agreement, and then you're in a contractual dispute. And, you know, that's costing your lawyers on both sides, and, and, and it's why people have mortgages and all that sort of stuff. So um, it is um, – uh, no, it's a, it, it, it would be a system that would just not work at all. Currently, but is there, do you see that that's possible for legislators to add that possibility um, to similar, let's say you have a company today and there's an individual who is uh, buying a share in the company. Um, he regularly would get an incumbent certificate and, and a good standing certificate and then he will be able to buy shares uh, knowing what the company uh, holds in, in uh, liabilities. Now, there's always a risk there that the company would have liabilities that are uh, not registered. Yet, generally, there's a clear process. Do you believe that legislators uh, will add that very soon to say that, you know, there is some shares or tokens sold on that property through this party, go back to it. Yeah, no, so, and sorry, I, I was giving you the, 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 the standard protocol of what would happen in Australia today uh, if, a, if a, a property owner wanted to, um, I, I don't know, realise 20% of the equity um, to pay down some senior debt or mezzanine debt or whatever the case may be. Um, free up a deposit to do another development, whatever they, 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 they 10,000 good reasons. Um, if, if those 10,000 token holders, 100,000 token holders decided to, um, and, and it would be a very easy document um, to, uh, for a lawyer to put effectively all those corporate resolutions together, put one caveat on the property and the second that someone came along to buy that property, they go, hang about, there's, there's, there's a thousand people out here who are owed money and owed income, um, you know, what have you got here? Then you can do your due diligence, then you know what the situation is, and that would protect, um, protect the purchaser of the property and protect the token holders. So I, I, I think it can, it, it can work very easily, it just doesn't work within the current the current accepted yeah. legal system, yeah? Yeah, so, yeah. Dennis, you had something to say, I believe, prior to uh, me inter intruding there. No, um, I was um, uh, just uh, remember that we, we started the discussion uh, just before we started um, uh, recording uh, about the corporate resolution being also used in the direction of because now we've been focusing on on owner on assets that are owned by by a legal entity right um and i think the there's an important step of going towards enabling um individuals owning real estate assets to use them you know tokenizing and and be able to use them through ocean point um, and the reason from a business perspective is if we would take Bitcoin initially to five banks, they would say this is, this is nothing, right? But because it wasn't taken to five banks, but anybody could, you know, make it grow, that's what gave value to Bitcoin in time, in, in a decade and more. Um, and I think it's similar here with Ocean Point, if we rely on on uh, you know bigger companies that own commercial real estate that don't have those issues or those challenges and don't see that value or that much value in this yet um you know we're gonna struggle building up a large enough pool of assets that is kind of locked in backing ocean point as a, as a protocol in DeFi. Uh, while if we go in the direction of enabling, you know, uh, you and me and uh, and uh, and everybody to basically um, tokenize their home, 
um, that's a game changer because it does indeed um, enable somebody to um, to do something with their own assets. They might have a mortgage on it, um, but there is definitely some equity uh, that has already been released through the repayment of that mortgage. Um, and that's valuable. And right now people are locked in uh, and they can't le really leverage it. So kind of opening up that space um, is, I think, important. And we were and with discussing liquidity about... squeezed, by the way, very soon, probably we'll see more need for that, yeah? Because currently liquidity is ample, but that is reversing very fast. Oh, it is. Dennis and I were chatting about that beforehand, and it varies from country to country, but Australia... Um, uh, Australia has a huge number of investment properties. Um, you know, it, it, it's been used by the vast majority, those that can, of the population as their wealth building tool. You know, there are people out there with five houses, all with, you know, maybe 20% equity in them um, and, and, and an interest rate going up. And, um, you know, something's going to, something bad's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> for too much longer, and so the, the banks are banks are just going to foreclose and sell up, but then and, and um, there is no other alternative. So um, I, I agree with Dennis. I think there's a we probably need a little bit more, a bit more thinking and finessing. But I think there's a, a huge opportunity there. Dennis, uh, you were talking about the opportunity, and you were talking about the ability of people to unlock value. Uh, however, uh, and that's individuals also, not only corporates, yeah, so people who see more value in the solution and people who have that problem at a more prominent level. Um, from, we've been discussing with individuals, and I'm sure you've been talking with several members of the team all over the world, um, each in his own space talking to individuals, and, um, and, and seeing how receptive are they to the idea since a very long time. How receptive have individuals been? Now, I know that we are already tokenizing some assets over the past few few days and putting some assets through the system. Um, however, how, how receptive have individuals been? And what are, some, um, what are some challenges? What are some concerns they have? Probably Simon would be the best person to come up and say, yeah. you know what, from a legal perspective, uh, those are answers to those challenges. So what are challenges that you're seeing and that, you, that, that are being put in front of you? Well, from, from our end, the challenge is that uh, we are not directly able to, um, to work with individuals because the jurisdictions, as Simon pointed out, have, you know, differ somewhat one from the other. So it needs to be localized. So for instance, um, there needs to be a partner in Australia that can enable individual owners to do to, to achieve this. There needs to be a partner in, in Germany that can enable, you know, people in Germany to do this. It, you know, we cannot do it from from uh, from one, you know, from one side, it needs to be spread out. Um, what we are doing is creating a template. Now that template is something that, you know, a team in Australia can take and make it better. It's just something that can, you know, they, that it can be localized to achieve goals within a jurisdiction. The challenges that, you know, me and my legal team see so far is ensuring that in like in simple terms, the asset owner doesn't just, you know, um, default or or sell the asset without um, the token holders um, having consent. at least uh, yes <laughs> giving consent or at least having a, an ability um, uh, you know to either stop the that that process or to have legal recourse afterwards um, and, uh, and, and file a dispute against the owner because they were going against an agreement, a contractual agreement. So there's always a legal entity 
the 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 the, the natural the, the the person that owns the asset and they have a bond a bonding through a contract through the the resolution that is then it becomes publicly um, published signed by both parties um, and the transfer of tokens gives you rights within that uh, that derive from that resolution. Um, so this is like the rough outline of how of how this uh, works. But as we talked with Simon before recording, as you have a jurisdiction that has certain laws in place that would just overwrite whatever is in this agreement, and so it needs to be verified by a, a lawyer that is present in a market and very familiar with uh, with uh, with how things work there. So. I can, I can give you a clap, and it will it will be case by case, right? Because it it it, it will be. Um, I, I hate to say this, but it will be very legally dependent to a large extent. But a, a, a classic case in Australia, and I'm I, I can't give you statistics. Um, I think it's you know moderately significant and and probably going to grow. Is what's called a negative mortgage where you've got people um, that do own their own house or effectively own their own house they're 65 they've retired they paid it off etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, uh, you know they don't have any children they don't like their children they don't want to whatever the case they need some money um, there are already financial institutions which will provide a negative mortgage you know, and and they charge an exorbitant fee for doing so. You know, I mean, there are there they are high interest rates by comparison, and you know, you've got eight hundred thousand dollars equity in your house, and what you're trying to do is free up forty thousand dollars, and um, you know, you 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 pay a fortune, and and they they pick it up when you die anyway. Um, you know, so there's 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 a number of different instances when where you can where you can apply this and and without without i think any undue you know legal concerns so um so why, why why would people go for a negative mortgage in alternative to a regular mortgage because they don't have any income okay and, and banks banks require servicing and they've retired they're on a pension um, the pension's not very much. Um, interest rates have gone through the floor. The stock market has shat itself. Um, their investments are no good, um, you know, and and they they want some money. Um, it, so they're they providing a, a sort of mortgage yeah. which is non-conventional, non-traditional, yet uh, their payout on payout day is much bigger, yeah? Oh, yeah. The, the interest rate, I mean, I... I, I did one for some, I, I don't do this sort of stuff as a rule, um, but I, I did one uh, for someone that I know. Um, you know, I mean, our base rate is maybe 1%, 1.25% at the moment. Um, banks might give you 2.5% interest if you put your money in them. Um and uh, you know these people are charging you seven or eight percent per annum um, plus fees. So it sits in the in the category of commercial loan more than anything else. And and by the way, Dennis, this is a perfect client for what we're doing because simply we can give him a a, a solution that he doesn't have access to in the market. So retirees on the list as as one of the. Uh, uh, most <laughs> retirees in Australia because I don't believe they have the same problem elsewhere. Yeah. However, in Australia they do. Yeah. But I did hear, Makram, Honestly, I did hear. I was talking with Ahim uh, about a similar company uh, like four, four or five months ago, I guess, in Germany, um, doing a very, very um, similar approach or a similar offering on the market uh, for people that have retired that they have. That, that that have paid off uh, their mortgages and they want to um, basically uh, receive some funds or squeeze some equity out of the uh, out of the house 
um, uh, and uh, but uh, I think it was it was more uh, along the line that they would be selling like a third of the house to to that uh, organization instead of uh, de- using debt. Yep, was more like uh, just selling a third of the house. You keep on living there and you pay a third of a pre-agreed um, uh, uh, rent, basically. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, so th- th- that's probably another solution, but you're still over there, not only selling your house, you're losing any um, future value. And at the same time, there's no way that you can reverse that process in a, on reasonable terms. Yeah, I'm sure that those co- guys who are coming in and buying a third of your house are getting a pretty handsome discount on a house. This is what I would want to do if I would, would want to buy a, a, a quarter or three quarters of a house, isn't it? Well, it gets old and as, a, as, as we would say, a deceased estate, it's never going to be the height of the market. Whereas if you tokenize a third of it or, you know, realize your money, then I as a token holder am betting that in, you know, the, heaven forbid, 10 years' time you die, um, the property has gone up in value and therefore I've just made some money on my tokens. Simon... <laughs> If, if I want to ask you, this is a difficult question, probably. Why would people, or why should people not tokenize their property? When do you see reasons or, or, uh, um, or state situations where you found that people in this situation should not tokenize their property? Well, um, it, it, depends, it depends very much um, on the level of equity, um, most, al- almost every uh, property in, in, in Australia is mortgaged. It's mortgaged to the full extent that the bank thinks it's prepared to mortgage it to. Um, and um, it's probably not going to, and, and this will be a difficult one, it's probably not going to accept the perception of any equity sell down which will diminish its return, um, you know, should the worst happen, whatever that case may be. So, you know, it, it, uh, I think it has specialised applications and, and, and they're not specialised in the sense that they are s- small or insignificant. I, I, I just think that they'll be... I, I think the investment property is a, is a real one. Um, you know, people are having to... are going to have to sell off investment properties at a loss um, whereas if they could tokenize that property um, and and someone you know can hold on to it for another five years, then um, they can pay back. So I don't know. I've got an investment property that's worth five hundred thousand um, it, dollars. It's 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 mortgaged for four hundred thousand dollars because the banks five years ago were just giving money away to anyone and anyhow. Um, the market's gone down a bit. It's 450000 not not 500 The bank says, I want my, my 400 I don't have the money. Um, if you could tokenize that for 450 or 500 you give the bank back the money, you're all okay, and the investors go off and they, they take their chances that in three, four, five years' time, um, they've made so you get other property speculators in the market, I suppose. But in this instance, what you, you can do is you get, um, a, 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 as Dennis and I were talking before we, in a sense, came on air, you know, you, you could end up with a whole bunch of 25 year olds who've got no hope, but they think that that, that suburb's going to go up in value and, you know, there's their $50,000 worth of tokens and, and that's an investment for their super fund or whatever the case may be. I, exactly. You, know, you were I, saying... I'm a financial planner and I, I have to preface this by saying I'm a lawyer and I'm not giving financial advice. Sure. Um, so I don't stretch the imagination. Um, otherwise, you know, I'll get sued. But you, know, you can think of a number of those circumstances where um, carefully thought out and structured... Um, uh, it could be commercially advantageous and and certainly legally, I think, you know, there are problems that can be addressed and solved. So here, um, I heard you talking, you and uh, Dennis, uh, at the time when I was testing, um, you were talking about 
people who are 25 or 35 or 30 years old today in, in plenty of markets would never be able to jump on the, the uh, uh, property ownership ladder with uh, the market state at what it is today and what's happening in our global economies. And this is a solution. So, yeah, I hear you here when you say that more liquid means that we are able to um, more fairly value that property and then probably tokenize it and get equity out of it um, at a fair value, regardless of the situation, if the markets are more liquid. Now, I'm sure we're still far away from that in tokenization as a process, in tokenization as a, as a craft. However, we're getting there with time. And when people realize that this is a solution to many problems that's there, it will be valued and, and, and it will be looked at as a, as a main option. Now here, I, I have a question to uh, Simon, the lawyer, and Simon, the investor, at, at, at the other hand, where, where um, <laughs> if you were going to tokenize a property today, because, you know, people, and, and I'm an investor, and I'm an individual at the same time, and I have concerns and fears and, 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 and uh, tendencies to have greed and all of those at the same time. And there are things that stop me sometimes from taking some choices rather than others. And those yeah. things that stop me mainly are things I don't understand. So if somebody is able to explain it to me, because people hate what they don't understand, whatever it is, good or bad. Sure. Sure. If people are able to explain it to me, it, it puts a different perspective on the whole thing. If you, Simon, the um, lawyer, is talking to Simon, the investor, who wants to tokenize his property today, what would you tell Simon <laughs> Owen to look at uh, and what would you tell him he needs to be careful with and uh, concerned about when tokenizing that property? Well, I think, I think um, producing documents that satisfy the legal requirements, at least within Australia, um, uh, uh, entirely within our grasp. You know, I mean, you know, I don't have time next week, but as a project over the next six months, we could do that. I think the major problem then um, is that, that we've got pretty strict um, financial laws and um, a financial planner is going to find it extraordinarily difficult to get their head around the fact that, you know, you're either, because let's face it, you're either going to token Let's 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 take the investment property or whatever it is. Um, you're either going to tokenize it because it's got a yield, right, or you're going to tokenize it because you think it's going to rise in capital value. And in in a perfect world, it's going to give you both. And that's why commercial property. Well, that's why commercial property is the logical place to start because you know it has a yield. It's demonstrable. Um, maybe it goes up and down depending upon the economic cycle. Um, and, and generally speaking, um, you know, it's, if, if the yield is going up a little bit, then its capital value is going up a little bit, it becomes a good, a good real estate investment. I think residential, um, you know, it becomes a little bit more of a lottery. Um, but um, so the, the lawyer in me says, you know, they are problems we can solve and they're not necessarily problems that, you know, will take us two years to solve by any stretch of the imagination. But I think... So can, uh, I, can, I, can I ask you here, why would you think uh, tokenizing residential is a lottery? Because I, I feel different, but if you would explain that to me. You don't know if the house price... Well, I mean, if, if, if it's a, an investment property, okay, it's a rental, Yes, the rental market in Australia is extraordinarily tight, so there's your yield. Um, if you pick your suburb correctly um, and, and, and things go well, then the pricing house will go up. You know, we've had, we've had ridiculous housing booms, in, particularly in, in, in Sydney and Melbourne and the eastern states, um, you know, where... Uh, yeah, it would have been a brilliant thing to do, but that's why everyone was buying investment properties. They they basically done it that way. But then they've got to go to a bank and they've got to borrow the money. They've got to have the equity, all that sort of stuff. Um, that's not a twenty five year old. 
if a 25-year-old says, you know, I want to put away, I don't know, $100, $100 a week out of my paycheck towards, towards property in the right tokens, um, then it comes, you know, a viable superannuation investment or whatever the case may be. But as I say, the financial industry is outrageously conservative um, and and uh, that would be the, that's the big barrier to entry there. And, and to be honest, they they're supposed to be, yeah. That that's something good, not bad in general. And they, they never used to be, but that's yeah. why they are now. <laughs> that's that's good. That is. Let me let me ask you a question. You're not only uh, you've thought about and lived tokenizing property for a very long time now, okay, for a few years, more than anyone around probably, and. Uh, I've arranged for you now a free session with a lawyer. And I'm sure within that period of time, specifically when you were tokenizing I've been, your... I've been free since I've known him. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. So probably you've asked you more, most of the questions. But if you want, Dennis, to ask a question today that, uh, that um, resonates in your head as somebody not only who tokenized properties of others, but who is tokenizing currently as we speak, a property of his, yeah? So you own yeah. property now that you're tokenizing. Uh, what concerns or questions come to your mind? Concerns is a big word for somebody who is selling property tokenization to the world today. However, what questions do come to your mind that you believe every average user would ask um, that, that you would love a session with a lawyer like Simon Owen uh, to, 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 uh, to answer? <laughs> <laughs> that's a, a good uh, a good question um, or, or you put it well um, yeah I mean by the way you you have to walk the the talk all right or how do you say it, right now you have to walk the talk um, but yeah I mean there's two sides I, I had so many conversations about real estate organization in the past three years that's right uh, with different type of people. So there's um, the similar, the, the interesting part is that similar questions come from a similar profile of people, right? Um, and uh, when you talk with a real estate developer, the main question is, you know, how do we raise funds with it? Um, when um, you talk with an individual, the main question is, how do I pay my mortgage with it? Um, and uh, most of the times, it's uh, an attempt of, you know, trying to get free money, which is not something that's going to happen. Nothing comes for free. And the less it is developed, the more expensive it gets even. Not, not necessarily, but it's not tokenization. It's not a magic stick that you can, you know, a magic wand and then, you know, bam, your problems are, are solved. It's not, it's not why we're doing it right now, but we hope that in time that's going to be much easier than, you know, going through the normal process where, you know, you need to convince a bunch of people on the way to support you on your I don't know, development project, for instance, you need to convince, you know, some private investors, you need to convince a bank, you need to convince a landowner, and so far, it's, that's not going to change. The only thing that might change is that you will, the, the process of convincing is going to go from, on, from the other end, instead of first convincing the bank and the landowner uh, on collaborating on the project and then going to some private investors, you might first turn to the internet for a portion of the funding, and then you can go to more traditional uh, players and that might ease up things or even the process. So uh, that's why we're doing this. Now, question that I have uh, for Simon is, How can we, in the conversations we make, instead of attracting people that have a high, a big mortgage, or you know, they're trying to build something that is not fi financially viable to 
look for tokenization is um, how do we want to instead talk to the people that are sane, the people that understand that they might use this for 10, 15%. And how do we make them feel comfortable from, because they have a concern on the legal part. Their concern is, yeah, but I tokenize 10%, 15% of, uh, of uh, my equity. Um, what are the, you know, my legal and tax implications? How do I feel comfortable doing this? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and look, I, I, I've come back to the, the, the most immediate user case that occurred to me when we, this first started happening really um, was uh, not, a, not a listed property developer because they can go to the market and get their money and go to the banks and do whatever else. Um, you, 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 you've almost got to do some due diligence and find some decent mid-level-ish, um, certainly not start-up, but let's say junior to mid-level honest property developers who work very hard to get a development or two up and off the ground and going, and you can then go to them and explain that the mezzanine finance that they're carrying at 12.5%, at uh, on which they're getting no yield because, you know, in fact, the yield's being eaten up, et cetera, et cetera. We can, we can take that bit out of their commercial equation, um, increases their yield, and p perhaps um, frees up then the deposit for their next project, which makes it easier for them to go to the bank, which makes their next development much easier. So we're a, we're a stepping stone to those sorts of things. And then that, that might lead to them, you know, tokenising a bit more and a bit more. Or, um, but but you, you, re, you almost want conservative property developers, you know, private conservative property developers. And I think in my mind, you know, and I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just a dumb lawyer, but, you know, that's <laughs> but, but if, I had to, if I had to explain to them what the commercial, what the legal risk was, that would be something I feel really comfortable sitting down and doing, right? And then they could get their accountant to go through it and make sure it works and all the rest of it. But I think, I think that's the low-hanging fruit, as they say, and once, once that happens, you've then got a portfolio of satisfied customers who recommend others and, and, and wherever. Um, but, but yeah, from a legal perspective, I think that's the lowest risk um, and, and the easiest explanation. Um, yeah. So that, 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 and, and that's always been the case in my mind. And I've, I've said that to Julia and, and I don't know who she's got in mind and, and, and what have you. But, um, you know, that's what we call mezzanine finance, um, yeah. you know, um, is uh, is the hardest to get, you know, and, and, and it's expensive. You know, you pay through the nose. Um, someone who's prepared to take a second mortgage, um, you know, and, 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 you know, your firstborn child for 17%, just so you can get your development, up, um, you know, is is uh, but but you know it's a good development, and that's you know you 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 need some people around you that can assess the quality of the development, the value of it, and the the, the surety of the yield. But um, legally, I think I can I can um, give them comfort. So, Simon, here, very important thing. It's definitely important to tell everyone in the world, the tokenization process is not a way for you to get free money, one. Two, um, today it's, it's not mature it's not enough blockchain. to, exactly, it's, it's not mature. It's blockchain, but it's not, it's not free money blockchain. Exactly. It's not mature enough uh, to, uh, to be able to offer you $100 million for your project in a week. So have the right expectations of it. Three, make sure that you approach it like any other business. It's not built 
with crooks around and none here is working to try and make you a fast <coughs> buck. Um, it's a mature yeah. business. Every single person of us is so concerned about his reputation and about how would he um, satisfy customers' needs at the same time, how would he protect clients and his company and his brand and, and all of those elements put together. Um, yeah. For it's, it's not a business or it's not a way for you to get away with the wrong valuation or with a crooked, not really, it's the other way around. Five, it's not a way for you to be less transparent and get away with it because you're supposed to be more transparent and you will be forced to be more transparent if you go through the process. Um, and last, six, and I'm sure there's 100 others, but six, you will be run through a KYC process and uh, you will be AML compliant. So it's not a way for people to money launder or to do anything that is um, a wrongdoing. Um, the process, for example, BlockSquare uses a third party for, uh, for um, those verifications. Very good, vigorous process. And, um, and that's what the industry is all about. And I'm sure we, there is dark rooms of an industry. There's dark rooms of every industry. And by human nature, people will try to do uh, sure. non-preferred practices. However, those are the practices we're advocating for. So Simon here, if I want to talk today to a lawyer, or to a regulator, or to a head of a land registry, or to a notary, or to an educator, somebody who's really concerned about doing the right thing and doing the right thing for the whole community. And mm -hmm. I want to describe or define what we do in simple but legal terms so that he understands it, whoever he is, even if he's not a lawyer, but in legal terms, so that when he talks to his lawyer, his lawyer verifies it for him. How would I define what we are doing to property? How do I define what we're doing to that uh, industry and that asset that's supposed to be very simple to understand and, and very, um, very satisfying to people who own and very value adding to every family and community? Please, can you help me with that definition? Uh, it, 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 obviously, there's going to be a process going through legal documentation and, and convincing people of new things and what have you. Um, I, I, I hope this is an answer to your question. Um, DeFi holds a mystery for people, right? And they, they associate it with all sorts of different things. It, it, it simply means decentralised finance, right? Yeah. And I remember yeah. years ago, it may still happen, but I haven't done it. Um, there's an eminent professor um, at the University of New York, and he used to take his summer holidays every year in Perth um, because in August it's pretty nice in Perth, well, but, you know, it's a place. And he'd give some guest lectures. Um, this is right at the beginning of blockchain. Some guest lectures at, at university. And I, I, I went to one of these. And he has got, I've never forgotten this, he has got a very simple graph. And it maps the efficiency of financial markets from about 1910 through till 2012, right? Wow. Now, Can I know you, the name of that lawyer? Uh, the, 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 the professor, yeah, yeah, yeah. The professor. Now, but anyway, um, and uh, if you can imagine the technological advancements that have occurred in that 10 years, um, telephones and telexes and blah, 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 um, you know, massive uh, uh, merchant banks, sweatshops, Christ knows what else. Do you know the variation in the efficiency of financial markets over that period has not deviated from something like 10% to 12%, which means that's the amount of money that's taken out of the system every single year by the financial industry, right? And, 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 and therein lies the secret to what we're doing, but in a in a in a small area, we're we're, we're just simply removing all of that crap and making <laughs> it very very simple 
um, and and very approachable and 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 democratized. And the fact that you know that you can use a blockchain for a large part of it, um, and or for you know the, the most part of it, means that you can you can introduce that that you know element of uh, uh, lack of trust as well. But I mean, so that that's how I would describe it to a financier. Is is all, all we're doing is taking this huge cost out of your business. Now, okay, the lawyers have got to sit down and convince you that this is not stupid and that that will work and what will happen and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, that's that's nothing much more than happens today. So um, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> it, it does. It does. I, I will track you to get the um, name of that professor uh, yeah. because I would love to have him on. Um, uh, I would love to see such a graph and... and uh, more explanation on that and knowing that he was talking at the beginning of blockchain it means that he probably understands the technology and everything that happened with it at a at least a bigger level than i do much bigger level than i do um you know it has been a very um, a comprehensive discussion i would say i can describe it as comprehensive um dennis do you have any questions to simon owen um, I would I would leave it as, as, as this. I think it was a very informative conversation. I hope that people who watch this um, take the time to go through it. Simon has uh, a, a lot of value that he shared with us today, um, valuable insights. So thank you, Simon, for for taking the time again. Um, and uh, well, I'm looking forward to that uh, with Julia and, uh, and yourself, we can, you know, move things uh, forward in uh, in the Australian market and uh, and uh, you know create some uh, some successful cases through it. I think with Ocean Point that this kind of changes um, the game a bit, um, as Julia describes. Uh, when she talks with property owners and as well with, with yourself, I think um, that is um, changing how how we approach the market. Um, yeah. Simon Owen, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. I believe you've added uh, the richness to uh, BlockChat and uh, at the same time helped us uh, get the message through in a, in a uh, scientific way, which is our target with no hype. Um, I hope that um, you're currently uh, invested in uh, uh, the right the right uh, technology, so that hopefully next discussion in few years will be uh, at uh, uh, a yacht. Uh, so, uh, as, as you mentioned prior to our discussion, Simon Owen, tell us: is there anything you would like to add? Is anything that you would want listeners to get um that you usually think of and you say if i can tell the world this today and i can put it on record so that uh so that it will impact them for the rest of their lives and they would get to a point of time and they will understand exactly what i'm saying now what would it be i uh, look dennis and his team have done all the work um and uh and and that's an enormous amount of work they, they produce what is now an advanced product. Um, it, it's ready to do things. Um, I'm I'm simply a, a you know a, a, a cog a cog in the wheel and and ha happy to be so and happy to help. So um, you know I think if if you've got any interest in the subject, um, you know Dennis is the man to Dennis the man to talk to. Or here in Australia, um, you know by all means pick up the phone to Julia um, and. Uh, you know, I'll be there somewhere, but I, I won't be leading the charge. So, but, uh, and now it's been lovely. Thanks, guys. Um, enjoyed it thoroughly, really. Thank you, Simon Owen, for being with us. You've uh, enriched our, our block chat session. Thank you for everyone who's uh, with us today. Um, hopefully, our session today has had uh, very little hiccups. Uh, we'll, we'll just know later on. So, we'll know with you guys or slightly before you. Uh, Dennis Petrovic, uh, Simon Owen, and Mekrim Hani have been with you on another blog chat discussing only what matters with no hype. It's a scientific approach discussing blockchain and DeFi in real estate. Ciao.